Good morning and happy Sabbath. Um, my daughters were a bit under the weather, so they stayed home with um, Dad. And so I had a bit of a sleepless night. And I think it's ironic that a few months ago, the theme of my sermon that I picked was wake up. <laughs> so um, hopefully I can stay awake and everyone else can as well. But um, it's been a really beautiful program so far. Um, and I'm really continuing on this theme of service to others. Um, and how much we need each other, um, that we actually can't do it on our own. We can't on our own show the world a picture of God's character of love and his salvation. We actually, his plan, his purpose is for us to work as a community and as a team um, to reflect his amazing salvation, his amazing love to the world around us. I'll just say a little prayer before um, I start. Dear Jesus, thank you so much that you didn't leave us in the dark, but that you came and you shined your light and your love to this world. And I just pray that you would send your angels and Holy Spirit to be with us now, that any obstacles would fall away from our eyes and that we would get a clearer picture of who you are and of the dreams you have for us and that you want us to wake up and not to miss out on the high calling and the amazing plan that you have for our lives. Thank you for hearing this prayer. We know it is according to your will. Amen. Okay. If you could turn with me to Romans 13, it's our key uh, verse for today. So Romans 13, starting at verse 8. And I love the song that Liz played um, during offering about loving others. It really fits in with the theme for, t for today. So Romans 13, verse 8. And it starts off, um, the Apostle Paul says, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves has fulfilled the law. And then Paul mentions some of the individual commandments. And it says they can all be summed up in the saying, love your neighbor as yourself. And verse 10 says, love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfilling or the fulfillment of the law. And then we'll continue verse 11 to 14. And says, he, Paul says, and do this knowing the time that now it is high time to wake up out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. So he says, and do this. Do what? What did he just say in the preceding verses? to love, to fulfill God's law of love, to love God, to love others. So he says, do this, knowing the time that now it is high time to wake up out of sleep, for now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, in lewdness and lust, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Do this knowing the time that it is high time to wake up out of sleep. In these verses, what are we being asked to put off or to cast off? Welcome to call out or raise your hand. Our old year has ended, a new year has just begun. Many of us probably have goals or hopes of being and doing better than we did last year. You know, putting away maybe some old bad habits, starting some new ones. But in these verses we read, what is it saying? What are we asked to put off or cast off? The works of darkness. So put off darkness. And then it gives examples. It says revelry. Drunkenness, lewdness, love, strife, envy. It gives examples. Revelry is a kind of old school word. But when we look at our society around us, would you agree that the idea that life is a party and that the chief object of my life is to have fun and a good time, would you say that that's a value in our society? Yeah. What about drunkenness? And this doesn't just refer to excess in alcohol. It's excess in anything. It's that spirit of self-indulgence of ex excess, lack of self-control. Would you say that you can see that around us in the world today, a lack of self-control, of excess? 
not in lewdness and lust. And you know, lust doesn't just refer you know, to sexual sin. It, it refers to just that lust, that wanting more, wanting more than what God has given you and believing that you'll be happy if you could just have, you know, if you could look like that person or you could have that car or that job or that, per, you know, whatever it is, just wanting more and never being satisfied. And strife and envy, um, I definitely don't need to convince you about that one. I, I don't even read the news really because it's so depressing to hear about all the um, acts of violence that are increasing in the world around us and in society and in our homes. Now what are we being asked to put on? So cast off, put off works of darkness and what are we being asked to put on? Yep, so verse 14 it said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in verse 12, it said also, put on the armor of light. We won't turn there, but in 1 John 4, 5 and 8, it says God is love. And it says God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. So we are being asked to put away darkness and the works of the flesh. You know, when the Bible says flesh, it sometimes says flesh or old man. It just refers to the natural human heart, that which is instinctive to humans, our natural desires that we're born with. And it's saying, put that away and put on the Lord Jesus Christ, his light, his love, follow in his footsteps. But you know, in society, the kind of main message you hear, and especially media and entertainment, is follow your heart. Even kids' films say that, right? Follow your heart. Do what you want. That's kind, you know, so. Should we trust the Bible when the Bible says, no, make no provision for your fleshly desires to fulfill their, their lusts, you know, don't follow your heart. Why is the Bible saying that? Well, in Matthew chapter 24, and we won't turn there, but I encourage you to read it in your own time, Jesus talks about what the world will be like right before he comes again, near the closing scenes of this world's of, of this earth's history. And it's not just turmoil in the political world or natural disasters. It's also society, a breaking down maybe in homes, um, in families. And he says in verse 12 that the love of many will grow cold. Okay. When I look around me, when I look around me, I see that the love of many is growing cold. It's not just acts of violence. It's an absence of acts of compassion and love. And, you know, in the book of James, it says it's, it's not just about not doing bad things. It's if you know to do good and you don't do it, that is a sin. So, you know, forget society, even in our Christian world, we sing too, far too much, and I include myself in this list, far too much of the works of the flesh, of strife, of envy, of lust, Whatever, you know, we're seeing not just that, but also an absence of the kind of compassion and love that we should be showing as, um, as Christians. Um, as a keen kind of student of history, um, I'm especially interested in World War II because it's so well documented. And I think it's one of the most perfect examples of what is within the human heart. Okay, in the world you hear the idea that, yeah, follow your heart. But in wartime particularly, or in any hard times, everything that is under the surface is brought to the surface, under pressure, okay? It's revealed. And we might think, I'm not that bad, but we don't actually know what's within us. And we might judge someone else who's acting in a way we think is not that exemplary, <laughs> but we don't know. Maybe if we had their childhood or upbringing, or we were going through their trials, maybe it would be like, 10 times worse. How can we judge? You know, Paul says in Romans, judge no one, but rather judge this, that you don't put an occasion to fall in someone else's path. And so war particularly reveals what's in the human heart. And I'm, at the moment, I'm reading Viktor Frankl's uh, Man's Search for Meaning, and he was a survivor of Auschwitz, and he, he lost his entire family. And um, he was also a psychiatrist, so he was kind of very well po po poised to observe how humans were acting in the concentration camp where he was also a prisoner. And he said overwhelmingly, most people succumbed to selfishness, 
self-preservation, um, cowardice, and sadly also even unspeakable acts of cruelty. He said acts of self-sacrifice and love were so rare. I'd okay. um, like to give an example of one of my favorites. There's many stories I love from World War II which show self-sacrifice and love. A really beautiful one is um, about a Catholic friar called Maximilian Colby. So because of his refusal to he basically, he didn't want to stop helping Jewish refugees and he refused to stay silent as he saw the, the racism, you know, the injustices that were just, you know, taking place in society. And so he ended up in the camp as well, even though he didn't have to be there, but because he spoke up and he was helping, he ended up in the camp. Now one day in his barracks, one of the men successfully escaped. Um, in retaliation, the guards at the camp, not you know, wanting to discourage anyone from following that example, randomly picked 10 people from the barracks and said, you will all starve to death for two weeks in a bunker. Okay, they, they, they punished them to two weeks, um, a slow, painful death. And one of the men started crying and said, my wife, my family, and Maximilian being a friar, he didn't have a family. And he said, he put up his hand and he said to the guard, excuse me, I'd like to volunteer to take his place. He didn't have to do that. He, he, pretty sure he was suffering enough in that camp. Um, a t slow, torturous death. And he took that guy's place. And witnesses said that when guards checked in on that bunker, he was always comforting the other people and he was the last one to die. Um, yeah, it's such a tragic story, but why are we so in awe when we hear stories like that? And the man whose life he saved, whose place he took, went on to tell the story of Maximilian Kolbe for the rest of his life. And when he was an old man, he said, as long as I have breath, I consider it my duty to tell others about this heroic act of sacrifice and love that Maximilian did for me. One of the greatest stories of self-sacrifice started far away in heaven. You had the God family, the Godhead, God the Father, Jesus, the Son of God, and the Holy Spirit. Three persons, three distinct personalities, but one in love, one in their throne, one in unity, the same character of love, the same government. This was no competition over the throne. It, this wasn't like the pagan religions where the gods that humans had invented, who very much resembled humans and were fighting with each other. Um, no, the Godhead was perfectly and is perfectly united in love and the government that they have, and in their good intentions towards humanity. But we know the story, a lot of us do. The head angel, the commander of the angels, Lucifer, began to rebel against God. Now he didn't say, let's go out and do bad things. He wasn't saying that, but he was saying, we, the angels, we're exalted wise beings. We know how to choose right for ourselves. Why do we need to submit to the authority of God and particularly the authority of Jesus? That's what really chafed at Lucifer. He became envious of Jesus and he wanted, he began to lust, to want more than what God had given him. And God had given him so much, but he wanted more. He wanted the place of Jesus. And he started to deceive the other angels and to say, God is... God is like a dictator. Why do we have to follow his law? Why can't we be free? We would be more happy if we could throw off the shackles of God's governance. And he deceived a third of the angels. And if we read in Genesis chapter 3, he ended up deceiving the very first humans that ever walked on this earth. That they too were deceived into thinking that following their own way rather than God's way would lead to greater happiness. Um, one of the Indian poets called Tagore, one of his poems has this line that says, freedom from the tyranny of the soil 
is no freedom for the tree. I'll say that one more time. Freedom from the tyranny of the soil is no freedom for the tree. So if trees could like walk and you know, think and all of that, if a tree ripped itself out of the soil, ripped its roots out, picked them up, <laughs> and, and said, I've had enough of being shackled to you, Grant. I'm going to make a break for it. I'm going to make it on my own. How long would the tree be happy for? Would its happiness last very long? Would it be disillusioned with its freedom, do you think? <laughs> yeah. And that's the freedom that Lucifer, who then became known Satan, the great adversary, that's what he was offering. Saying, hey, freedom from the government of God, it'll be great. But really, it's ripping yourself away from your life support. God is not, like Satan tries to make God look the way that Satan actually is, egotistical. God is not saying, look at me, worship me, obey me, because he wants all eyes on himself. No, he created us. He knows we can't live without him. He knows that, especially now, the only way we can be saved is if we look at him. But Satan has succeeded to a large extent in plunging the reality of God's character into darkness. And God is calling us to wake up and to shed light on the amazing character of God. Now, when, when this world was plunged into darkness, there were some pretty amazing sacrifices made. God the Father first sacrificed his son, gave up Jesus to come to this world, to leave his side and to be born again as a little helpless baby. Okay, any parent who's ever experienced separation from their child knows the agony of that. And so to go on this mission of an infinite risk, God the Father sacrificed Jesus. Now Jesus, what sacrifice did he make? Okay, when we read in, um, we, we, we won't turn there, but in Zechariah there's a beautiful prophecy where there's hundreds of prophecies in the Old Testament about Jesus, but this is one of them. And it says that there's a picture of Je there's someone who's like Jesus, and they say to him, what are those wounds with which, you know, on, on your hands? And he says, these are the wounds with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Okay, he, he calls us his friends. When Judas betrayed him, he said, friend, why, why have you come? Okay, that's the kind of God we serve. That Jesus left the peace, the glory, the beautiful atmosphere of heaven. He cast aside, he put off. However he looked before, I don't know, he chose a human body to be greatly limited. He chose to live a life of submission to God the Father so that we can follow in his footsteps. Okay, just think, Jesus had infinite power at his fingertips. Can you imagine how hard it was for him not to use that to defend himself or to prove with force who he was? That is why Satan, when he tempted Jesus, said, if you are the son of God, do a miracle for yourself. You know, make the stones into bread. If you are the son of God, cast yourself off the temple and prove to everyone that God is on your side. Everyone will see you, you know, exalted with angels around you. If you are the son of God, worship me and I will give you this world. In other words, I will give you this world and you don't have to go along the path to the cross. You don't have to give your life for this world of ungrateful, unbelieving humans. Okay, so in Hebrews, if we can turn there, can you please turn with me to Hebrews chapter 2? So Hebrews chapter 2. These are such powerful verses. Like, it just shows how Jesus became our brother. And, you know, he didn't come in Isaiah 53. It says he had no beauty that we should desire him. He didn't come with beauty or talents or riches. He came as a humble human from a lowly family in a bad town. 
He put that he put all the riches he had, all the glory, all the power aside. And he chose to put on love and humility and self-sacrifice. So if we read in Hebrews 2, it says in verse 14, Hebrews 2, 14, Inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared in the same. In other words, he has shared in the lot of humanity, the suffering of humanity. It says that through death, his death, he might destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil, and release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. For indeed, he does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. In other words, humanity. Therefore, in all things, he had to be made like his brethren, like his brothers and sisters in this world, that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the things pertaining to God, to make reconciliation for the sins of the people. For in that he himself has suffered, he knows how to help, how to aid those who are tempted. Okay, so when Jesus was in this world, when you hear that phrase that he was tempted in every way that we were, I know when I was younger, particularly, I'd think, well, how is he tempted the same? Like, they didn't have technology back then, and, like, life was so different. Surely he couldn't have had every temptation that I've ever had. Have you ever thought that? I don't know. <laughs> I did, certainly at different times in my life. But the realization is it doesn't matter about the individual sin, because at the root of sin and temptation is the temptation to follow in the footsteps of Lucif Lucifer and be your own God and govern yourself and live independently of God. And that was a fierce temptation for Jesus, okay? That he had to put aside his power, his own will, okay? When he was in the Garden of Gethsemane, he said, if it's possible, I don't wanna do this. You know, he was a human like us. Yeah, he knew he was going to be raised in three days, but he only knew that through faith in the word. All his feelings, all his circumstances seemed to point to the fact that he was going to go into the grave and never come out. That's how he felt. That was his reality. And just like if we were facing suffering and, and, a, and a long, painful death, we would have hope in the comfort of heaven but you don't see it yet. Jesus didn't see it. He didn't feel it. But his love, his self-sacrifice was so great that he chose it anyway for us. And now he is in heaven as our high priest. He has already paid the price for each of us to be in heaven. As it says in the Bible, if, he is, if God has already given his son, is there anything that he wouldn't give? What? What would he hold back? Why would he give up on us when, you know? But the, the truth is, even though I know this story, this story I've tried to tell you sort of very briefly, the, and I encourage you, um, I'm at the moment reading through the Conflict of the Ages series. If you've never read the Conflict of the Ages, particularly the Great Controversy, but the whole five books, which tell the history of the world, you know, where suffering originated and evil and what's, you know, what the future holds, if you haven't read it for a long time or ever, I encourage you to read it again, um, to reset your perspective. But I know this story. I've been a Christian for many years. But the truth is that I forgot about it. So I moved to this church about a year ago. And um, I guess as can sometimes happen, up until this point, until I moved here a year ago, I'd been pretty busy. I'd been homeschooling four kids, two of which were my own. And I'd been really active in my old church, helping with small groups. And, and then when I moved here, firstly, let me say how much I fell in love with this church community. The blessings have been so great. I knew that I was in the right place when I saw that, to know Jesus and to make Jesus known. Like, could there be a better description of the essence of life? So I just... This is like the friendliest church, and I was so happy to come here. But friendships are not formed overnight, and, you know, I wasn't, you know, I could have volunteered. I'm sure I could have found ways to serve, but the truth is I didn't. And life became quite comfortable and easy. My oldest started school. I was just at home with my, um, with just one child now, and I was like, nice, I can relax now. I can sort of take it easy. <laughs> and... 
as we know from the Bible, like the kings of Israel are a perfect example. What happened to them when life got easy? <laughs> they forgot how much they needed God. And they thought that they had made themselves strong. And it's embarrassing to admit this. Like, I've been a Christian for so many years. I know all these things in theory, but theory is just theory. And somehow, and it's so slow and gradual, I just stopped looking at this great story and at Jesus in the Bible as much as I should have been. And little things just started to crowd out the Word of God from my life. And the truth is that just like the moon has no light of its own, but only what is reflected from the sun, we have no light and no love in and of ourselves. And that's a hard thing to accept. You know, Christianity can seem like such an attractive religion. Like, why wouldn't you want to be a Christian? You can go to heaven. And so if it's such a great reward, why is it so hard sometimes? Because like Lucifer... It's not natural for us to depend upon God. Every other religion, your goodness, your, the source of goodness is within yourself. Christianity is unique in that it says, no, I can't do it on my own. I, have, I can do nothing without God. And so I knew that, but like, I stopped looking at Jesus and selfishness and pride and just worldly things just started to take over. And I found myself backsliding the most I'd ever had in my life to the point when my faith was almost extinguished. And the amazing thing is that this church community helped me so much. Um, just the prayers, the text messages, and the opportunities to help and be a part of things. Even just the opportunity to teach at TVAC. I was so discouraged and disappointed in myself. And even though God had so many times shown me that he forgives and that he doesn't give up, I kept looking at myself. And you know, there's that saying, when I look at myself, I think, how can I be saved? But when I look at Jesus, I think, how can I be lost? He's so powerful. But I've always struggled with doubt in my life and looking to self and to my works. And any anyhow, as I started, I guess the cure was service to others and God showing me his love through church family and friends and that's why my message today is wake up to the high calling you have in God and the privilege to serve because it was for instance serving at the school even when I was discouraged I saw these precious children many who'd come from non-Christian homes and I knew there was nothing I could do for them unless I was depending upon God if I was to be the teacher they deserved to have, I had to draw close to God. And there's a story that El, one of my favorite writers, Ellen White, tells of a traveler traveling in a snow blizzard and they've gotten lost. They feel like falling asleep. You know, they're about to give up and just fall into the snow and let the snow just cover them. When this traveler sees a much younger traveler lying in the snow, already asleep, it seems like they're almost lifeless. And when this traveler saw that, he roused himself and started to rub the limbs and try and bring life back to this person and try to wake them up. And what do you think, as he was trying to wake up the traveler, what do you think was happening to his cold, numb sort of arms? And what do you think was happening? He was waking up. The blood started to flow a bit faster and and his own life was saved. And so working at the school was a big blessing, but when that finished, I was like, phew, okay, I can, I can relax now. I can relax now again. But back to just being at home, you know, with Amelia. Um, it was a big change. But God had other things in mind. He knew that I needed to learn to depend upon him and his love. And the fact that to truly trust that he is willing and able, not just to save me and you, but to use us to be his witnesses. That's his power, that's his delight. And so what happened was I got a phone call one day saying, from a lady I'd only met a handful of times, saying, would you please take my children to live with you? <laughs> Her two little boys. And I'd never met them, 
and I didn't know the circumstances and I had to make a decision that day. And so my husband and I prayed and we were like, okay, we will. And you know, and if it's going badly, like if we feel like if it's affecting our girls negatively or something, you know, we'll just have to, but we'll, we just have to take them in. Like this is pure religion to help widows and orphans in their trouble. And the truth was this lady, this beautiful young lady was a widow and she was struggling so much and had had a health breakdown. And so the boys came and, and I was like, yes, this is noble. This is the right thing to do. But then reality set in and the first month was a massive adjustment period. The boys were anxious and it was really challenging. And I was struggling, especially because I hadn't been depending on God as I should have been. I'd been selfish and now suddenly life was so hard. <laughs> and I was like, like Jonah, the reluctant prophet. I was like, God, why did you give me this job? There has to be someone more patient. You know, I'm a high school teacher, like little, he just keeps giving me little kids <laughs> to teach me patience. And I was like, God, there must be someone more organized, more patient, more loving. I, I'm not doing a good job. And I felt angry at God, God and I was frustrated. But then very quickly the answer came to me. He knew I couldn't do it. That was the point. He wanted me to remember to depend upon him because depending upon him, I could do it and I can do it and I am doing it. But now I can say like 100%, it's all him and that I know I couldn't have done it on my own. Um, there's a quote that I really love um, in the book Ministry of Healing. There's a chapter called Help for Daily Living. And if you are going through trials right now, like you feel like, yeah, I think we all have trials. In the book of James, it says we all struggle in many things. So listen to this quote. This really helped me a lot when I was struggling. No other influence that can surround the soul has such power as the influence of an unselfish life. The strongest argument for Christianity is a loving and lovable Christian. But to live such a life costs at every step effort, self-sacrifice, and discipline. It's because they don't understand this that many are easily discouraged in the Christian life. Maybe you sincerely consecrate your life to God, but then you're surprised and disappointed. You find yourself as never before confronted with obstacles, beset by trials. We might pray to be more like Jesus, a fitness for his work. And, we're, and then we're placed in circumstances that seem to call forth all the evil in our nature. Faults are revealed of which we did not even suspect the existence. And like Israel of, Israel of old, we say, if God is leading us, why is this happening? It is because God is leading you that those things are coming upon you. It is because God sees in you something precious that he wishes to develop. And let me be clear, God is not the author of suffering or evil. That's Satan. But if through our trials we can learn to depend less upon self and to depend more upon God, then something good will come from them, certainly. Um, I guess to conclude, I mentioned in the quote Israel of old, how many months should it have taken them? When they left their slavery in Egypt, how many months should it have taken them to reach Egypt? Not even months. I thought it was a couple of months. So it should have taken 11 days. Okay. And, and like, you know, they had lots of little kids if it took a bit longer than that. But, you know, that's not, a, that's not that long. How long did it end up taking them to reach the promised land? More people should know this one. How long? 40 years, a whole generation. Okay, in the testimony, Robin mentioned preparation for end times. Um, and as it said in Romans, the best way to prepare for the end times, it says, do this, do what? Love, knowing the time that it is high time to wake out of sleep. So the best preparation for end times is basically to look at the love of God for you and to believe that he is able to use you for that love to change others. If he could use me to be a blessing to this lady at the lowest spiritual time of my life, he can use you. And it's been hard for me to have faith in that. You know, I think I'm too much of a mess. God can't use me, but he can. And I just like to say at the end that 
we are just like Israel at the borders of the promised land. Okay, we are living in the time of the delay when the bridegroom is delaying his coming. Every single time prophecy has been fulfilled except for his coming. We know that Sister White said that Jesus was ready to come. So if he was ready to come, that means he had dealt with all the cases of people in history of this earth. Um, he's dealing with the cases of the living, but you know, as it says, if it seems like he's delaying, it's because he's long suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish. And so here we are at the borders of the promised land. And if you, like me, have some forgotten that you're meant to be a stranger and a pilgrim in this land, then I encourage you, cast off the works of darkness. Put off the night. The day of his coming is near. Let us put off the work of darkness and let us unite together as a community and wake up and rise up to the challenge of shedding light on the amazing character of God's love to the people that he's put in our lives. Amen. Thank you, Yelena. It's so true how often God uses me at my lowest to teach me um, when I'm, I'm helping others. Uh, our final song for today, I don't have my program and I know it as well as anything. Um, how deep the Father's love for us, of course. Um, uh, and genuinely, even in our lowest of lows, how deep the Father's love is for us. And even when we are so incredibly, oh, I'm speaking for myself, hopeless. Oh, I think to myself all the time, God, just take away my power of choice. I'm really bad at it. I'm hopeless. Um, and he's so patient and long-suffering and endlessly forgiving and endlessly loving. So please stand with us and sing How Deep the Father's Love. Yeah. 
Stay standing as we conclude with prayer. Yeah. Dear Jesus, um, just like just like that man Maximilian took the place of one of the prisoners and gave him life, you took our place, you took our shame, our guilt, you took infinite risk upon yourself, not even just to save us, just to give us a chance to choose salvation, and you knew full well that many would choose to not accept, but you still did it, just to give us that choice. And I pray that today, each of us would make the choice to accept, and to accept again every single day, and not to ever give up hope, and to be like that man whose life, the prisoner whose life was saved, and to say, I consider it my duty that with every breath, with the, we will tell the story of your heroic act of love and self-sacrifice and I just ask that we would make that choice to unite as a community and to show your, li your light and your love to those around us and that I ask if for those of us if it is our desire to allow our life to tell your story that we would raise our hands and show you that at the beginning of the year that we want to know your love and we want to show it to those in our lives and that you are able to make this happen because that is your will and your word will not fail, but it will not return to you void. So we claim that promise and we thank you for your love towards us. Amen. Stay standing as we conclude with prayer. Yeah. Dear Jesus, um, just like just like that man Maximilian took the place of one of the prisoners and gave him life, you took our place. You took our shame, our guilt. You took infinite risk upon yourself, not even just to save us, just to give us a chance to choose salvation. And you knew full well that many would choose to not accept, but you still did it, just to give us that choice. And I pray that today, each of us would make the choice to accept, and to accept again every single day, and not 
to ever give up hope and to be like that man whose life, the prisoner whose life was saved and to say, I consider it my duty that with every breath with the, we will tell the story of your heroic act of love and self-sacrifice. And I just ask that we would make that choice to unite as a community and to show your, li your light and your love to those around us. And that I ask if, for those of us, if it is our desire to allow our life to tell your story, that we would raise our hands and show you that at the beginning of the year, that we want to know your love and we want to show it to those in our lives and that you are able to make this happen because that is your will and your word will not fail, but it will not return to you void. So we claim that promise and we thank you for your love towards us. Amen.